Good morning, everyone. We thought we'd have a little bit bigger turnout, but uh, it's one person at a time, right? Um, thank you for coming. I'm Denise Stevens, Economic Development Director for the City of Littleton, and welcome to Investing in the Future of Downtown. So I'd like to begin with having Mark Ralph, our city manager, make a few introductory remarks. So, Mark. Good morning. I'd probably just stand right over here and talk to you, but we're recording this. <clears throat> so I do want to welcome you, and I know that um, you know, we've had a conversation here in the past about what could be possible in organizing our downtown a bid or a DDA. And I think uh, I'm hoping that uh, this morning is a little more conversational that we can kind of talk about maybe some experiences from our guests here about how they kind of started things. How did the conversation kind of begin? And then eventually they, they did things that were much more formal. <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of share my story, which I know I've talked a few of you about, but. You know, I worked in Grand Junction for 16 years, and they had a DDA that had been long established, long before I ever got there. And uh, if you've been there downtown, it's, you know, it's unique, it's different, it's not like ours here in Littleton. Um, but I was in a unique position. I was the Public Works and Utilities Director at the time, and so I had a pretty deep relationship with the, the DDA of Grand Junction. And it was a very unique kind of partnership that existed there, where obviously you had business owners property owners who formally organized and decided what were kind of the goals, the projects that they wanted to take on. And um, then it was a, a very clear partnership with the city. And so the, while the DDA had their own resources, the city then kind of matched that into a large extent. And we took on all sorts of interesting projects, not just the typical landscape and kinds of issues there that uh, you know, perhaps we may want to talk about, streetscape. Uh, parking, of course, was a common issue for probably most downtowns. And uh, I learned a lot in those 16 years in Grand Junction talking about parking. And when I came here to Littleton, I shared this story and started hearing, you know, kind of the conversations from our merchants, our property owners downtown. I swear, I felt like I was right back in Grand Junction all over again. And so, you know, I think, um, I, I, I just believe that the organization of our merchants, property owners downtown, provides a unique opportunity to do things that carry us way out into the future. In our city here, you know, we've got limited resources just like anybody else. And so it's not like we can invest everything we have in our downtown. I think what we have downtown is quite special. And I, you know, being an engineer, I have an eye for things about streetscape, and there's lots of things I'd like to talk about. What, what can we do? The city's a little bit kind of limited in our ability, and that's why I've always thought that our Littleton downtown, if we were to organize in some way, would be just a, a beautiful relationship to kind of pursue lots of things that would just strengthen our downtown. And specifically, you know, into the future, through the highs of our, the economy like we currently have, and certainly through the recessions, too, is to kind of strengthen that relationship. It's an asset, and we should never take it for granted. I spent eight years in a suburb north of Seattle that did not have a downtown and struggled deeply trying to create one. And that is a much, much more difficult task. And so that's why, you know, my, my hope is that, is that we recognize clearly what we got, but try to look to the future to try to organize something to take on the things that, quite honestly, you feel are important as the merchants and property owners and then create that partnership over time. And again, I've just seen just amazing things happen out of a, out of a relationship like that. So welcome. And um, I think, too, after our discussion here, we might talk a little bit about, OK, well, what's next? And I've always uh, felt like you know this is about self-determination. It's not the city trying to tell people exactly what to do. We certainly can facilitate things like this morning. But if there is an interest, you know, by a handful, there's a lot of things the city could do to kind of help identify what is the potential, what are the things that you would like to perhaps take on. And so perhaps at the end of the meeting, we could talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so again, welcome. 
And um, Denise, I'll let you take it from there. So I'm just wondering when the slides are going to come up. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so why invest in a district? And I had a meeting with a very special person in this room at one point, and he said, well, if you own property in Littleton and you are a business in Littleton, uh, that's great, but if you're not a resident, you don't necessarily have any political influence. And that made a lot of sense to me. So probably the number one reason is autonomy, self-direction, political influence over the future of the district. Improvements, you're gonna be in a better position to assess the needs and, and address those needs if you have a district. You're not gonna to have to depend on the city who may or may not have money at the time to make those improvements. Um, you can have district branding and marketing. There's a lot more power behind that as a unified entity. Um, it can improve property and business values and consistency. I've been in places where districts have been formed and they're consistently clean, they're consistently aesthetically pleasing, and they have a consistent feel about them. So I, I want to introduce our first speaker. We have two people here who've actually formed districts and know a lot about them. And our first speaker is Steve Glick. He's with the city of Golden. Steve has been a proponent of vital, healthy, economically strong urban environments throughout his lengthy career in municipally oriented city planning, economic development, sustainability, and community development. And I've worked with Steve over the years, and I can tell you he does everything. So he has degrees from Michigan State University and the University of Colorado at Denver, and has focused his professional career in the cities of Lakewood and Golden, Colorado, and international work through the International City and County Managers Association, ICMA. Steve is the Director of Community and Economic Development for Golden, Colorado, and serves as the Director of the City's Urban Renewal Authority and Downtown Development Authority. So please welcome Steve. Eric, can you help me get to this next deck? I'm sorry. We just need to pull up another. So thank you very much. Um, were any of you at this, when was the meeting? Two months ago? Two months ago, yes. Were any of you at the meeting here two months ago? You were, nice to meet you, thanks, sir. Steve. Steve, yeah. Um, I decided to bail out September 26, 2018. Um, and so my answer to why was um, focus and control. That, um, oh, or I could stand here. No, no, I don't want to hold the microphone. Um, it, it's, as your city manager mentioned, um, there's a lot of competing interests in a community and one of the discussions that we also had, and I'll go through this presentation fairly quickly and hopefully be more conversational, was we had gone through a long, fairly long journey from 1989 to 2014 downtown, and the, the question was going to be, how do, how do we continue? How do we maintain? How do we assure that downtown gets the appropriate amount of attention when it competes with everything else? And that was one of the main reasons we ended up transitioning from a URA to a DDA in the downtown area. So, um, in 1989, City of Golden was a pretty desolate place. Um, roll up the sidewalks, tumbleweeds rolling down the, the street, lots of vacancies, and over, over the decades, the, um, the urban myths grew to, um, I think, a little bit more stark than it really was, but it was a time for decision, it was a time of actually desperation, and um, at the time, the city fathers felt and mothers felt that a urban renewal authority was a good idea. So, fast forward um, to 
to 2013 when that project, which has a 25-year life by state statutes, was coming to an end, and we had to figure out what to do. Oops. The wrong way, okay. So during that time period, um, we established programs, um, some of which I'm, I'm always shocked how much they cost, and I'm sure you know as a downtown area, um, the cost of additional maintenance that a downtown area deserves, the cost of holiday decorations, the talk of, cost of wayfinding signage, the things that make a downtown special are, are not at all cheap. And so we did all of those things during the urban renewal area era. We also did um, urban, um, <clears throat> tax increment financing redevelopment agreements. We had a number of blighted properties downtown that needed major investment more than the market would, would support. And um, we also then, as we got more successful, we did programs, um, facade grants for individual smaller properties, website grants to, for businesses, business assistance type grants, uh, participating, partnering with the chamber and other people and doing business trainings. But really looking to realize that um, vitality downtown. But we got worried. We got worried, well, what will happen? What will happen when we have a successful organization that is basically term limited because of state statutes? And so um, a stakeholder committee of um, downtown owners, businesses, and residents. And um, Denise mentioned the, the issue of um, the only people that get to vote in your political elections our, our residents, um, downtown property owners, downtown businesses are vitally important to the community, but they, they don't necessarily have as much of a say in the elections every two or four years. So we got together a task force, they looked at different alternatives. In the end, we really only looked at a couple alternatives. Um, Trust that the city will have enough resources and focus to continue to invest resources downtown and that the, everything will go well. A business improvement district that you you've have heard about or will hear about and a downtown development authority. Um, the DDA is um, created by under state statute. It's in many ways similar to urban renewal, but it's really tailored to the downtown area. So we had a task force in 2013. Um, they talked about what, what a DDA is. Uh, many of you know this, some of this. That, um, but what's different from this and other entities is it creates, it requires a vote of residents, business owners, property owners, and to some degree, nonprofit owners if they own property in the nonprofit entities if they own property in the downtown area can be electors, and so it really takes a coalition of the affected parties to want to achieve that focus and control to, um, to achieve the DDA. This was actually our road show that we did in 2013, the last slide saying what it is and why you should, um, <clears throat> why you should be supporting it. And the main one I think is number two, a dedicated organization that has sufficient funding and focus and commitment to the downtown area. And you know we were a little bit concerned that without it, our our successes of the prior 25 years would start to fade. Um, we were fortunate enough that the um, and so this is coming out of the recession. Uh, we actually did okay in the recession, um, thanks in large part to the strength of downtown and the strength of some some retail centers. Um, the Urban Renewal Authority promised some seed money, the city promised some seed money, but city council said they were only going to strongly support it if the DDA authorized in their vote a property tax. Uh, the Downtown Development Authority has the ability to levy up to a five mil property tax. You don't have to levy that much, but to tax themselves, and what that does in, in our situation was it showed the strong commitment of downtown and right now it raises about um, about half of our revenue, but it's a, it'll be a shrinking component of our revenue as sales taxes grow and as the property tax increment from new new developments grow. 
It is, does have the ability to issue bonds if the, the electors approve. This is an example of tax increment financing that many of you might know. Any entity that can do that, the base is adjusted. The dark blue is the base. That's adjusted every two years in the biennial assessment, which will happen again in 19. In 2017, you probably late in the year got the letter that said your property was worth a whole lot more than it was before, and you got the pleasure of paying more taxes. That's the, the ratchet up. The light blue above it is when there's new construction in that area, um, a, an entity that can collect increment gets to keep that and use it for purposes of supporting the district, um, whatever the programs, projects, capital infrastructure especially. So our tax force made recommendations that we should focus on redevelopment, capital infrastructure, and business attraction and retention. We believed that there were lots of benefits to um, property owners that um, especially those two types. Property owners that had property that needed major redevelopment could, could seek to work with developers and with um, the DDA to, and we have two of those going on right now, to um, use tax increment financing for a major, re a major reconstruction. And as any of you who are property owners, you know how expensive it is to renovate old buildings. Uh, right now, um, the Buffalo Rose, which claims to be one of the oldest bars in the state, is under a, um, about a $3 million renovation that there's no way they could have afforded it without a little bit of assistance. And the assistance that we're providing, in the end, is a principal amount of $250,000. It's, it's about 10% um, of the landlord um, repairs. Um, another one is a historic building that was a mortuary for the last 80 or 100 years. And they're just starting that renovation. And as the property value increases, the DDA will collect that increment and put it back. That's not really what we do mostly, that's two exceptions. What we mostly do are the types of benefits that we anticipated before it was established. But benefits to merchants, holiday lights, extra maintenance, um, website grants, pro various programs. But we also felt there were benefits to residents. Having residents in the downtown area really is, is vital to the, um, well, the vitality that the, not just till 5 p.m. vitality of your downtown area. So we needed to make a case as to why it's to their benefit to pay an extra five mils on top of the about 78 mils is what our property tax is right now. So an extra six or eight percent on your property tax for the pleasure of living downtown and having extra services. Um, and to be frank, while at the same time having extra noise, extra traffic, um, extra people around in the evenings coming out of entertainment centers. And you have to really like to be downtown to live downtown. And we needed to try to tell them why it was to their benefit. Oh, we did talk last time I was here about boundaries and at a, um, another conference recently. There are logical boundaries for your downtown area and then there are nuances to that that are required if you want to have enough support from businesses, property owners, and residents. And these are our boundaries, and they actually do make sense if you, if you come to visit us in Golden. The five mil impact, we, we were upfront with people. For every $100,000 of your commercial property assessed value, no, actual value, um, you'd contribute an extra $12 a month or $145 over the year and um, much less for residential, of course, because of the, the variation in um, assessment ratio. This was a big deal. Who gets to vote was a big deal. It was also a big deal in trying to hold the vote. Fortunately, you only have to have one vote for a DDA because it's lots of work to find people who aren't your normal electors, to find business owners, property owners, and we had to go out and search them and get them to register as an elector so that we could have the vote. Um, you need at least one ballot measure to, um, to establish it. You really only need one question, and that's asking those electors, do you want to be a DDA? We had four. Um, 
we had, do you want to be DDA, which was the first one. Will, are you willing to tax yourselves up to five mils, which was council's requirement to strongly support the DDA. And then while we were at it, um, we asked, um, would you authorize bonding? And our legal counsel wanted us to do this. I don't see us ever issuing bonds, and we don't have nearly the revenue now to warrant issuing bonds. Um, and I had some concern as to whether a vote in 2013 would be valid to issue bonds in, say, 2020 or something. But our legal counsel said, if you're going to do this one, you might as well, if you're going to do all the other ones, you might as well do this one. The more important one was to debruce that there's no way that a DDA could actually realize its increased revenue from, uh, from growth if it was subject to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights um, growth cap in your revenue. So this one was what's more important than the bonding one. And then governance is dictated by state statute. It can be up to 11 board members. They all have to be electors. So they, that means they all have to be property owners, business owners or residents in the downtown area. They're appointed by city council. It's up to council to make sure to appoint the right balance of those interests. Lots of DDAs in Colorado. And that's kind of the quick version um, since we're a small group today. Do you see your, the, that bill coming down eventually after a certain amount of time? Um, I don't know. Um, traditionally, it certainly could. You could. It could go down to, to zero. No, to lower it. What? Okay, so I don't know if, if any of you follow property taxes a lot. No, then I'll have to hold it. <laughs> I don't want to hold it. It's like I chained myself to it. Um, in our case, um, Jefferson County is subject to um, both a a cap, statutory cap, and an increase in their revenue, and and Tabor. And so when they hit that, they do what's called a temporary mill levy reduction. And what they, if you permanently reduce the mill levy, then you can't raise it again without a vote of the electors. But so in order to get around that, and also to deal with the weird things that happen on reassessment years, when all of a sudden it jumps up and the next year it doesn't, they do what's called a temporary mill levy reduction. So the, um, in our case, and I hope we're doing it right, city council, the DDA's budget is part of the city's budget, and it is city council who authorizes that five mil levy on behalf of the DDA. But anyhow, you can, redu you can reduce it anytime you want. Whoever, whoever's in, authorized to, rate, to impose it can reduce it, and the advice would do, be do a temporary mill levy reduction, even if it's temporary forever. Um, I mean, that's the, gov the, the government side is you don't want to give it away forever because what if you really need it? Now, the other answer is if you really need it, go back to the electors and they'll approve it. But um, it, it, could simp it could certainly go down. And you'll notice that um, mill levies do go up and down or mostly, mostly go down um, from entities that are subject to Tabor, like the school district. When the Oh, how many residents? Yeah. <sighs> About um, 300 dwelling units. So, uh, is that 20% or is that? Of the value? No, not of the value, but of the numbers of the, uh, of the DDA, of the 50-50 uh, commercial to residential, or is it 70 <clears throat> commercial residential? So the commercial property owners generally own much bigger properties, so there's, there's less of them. Um, it's probably 30, 30, 30, 30, or a third, a third, a third between businesses, property owners, and residents, or commercial, commercial property owners, businesses, and residents, because the residents are mostly owners also. Uh, we don't have any big rental projects in the downtown area. Sir, Steve. So clarify, uh, the TIF financing uh, and the mill levy increases. So what percentage of your, would you say your budget comes from the tip? Ah. And what comes from the mill? Okay. So we've been in existence for a short period of time. Um, 
One of the weird ironies is for almost all of the period of the, the last period of the urban, this is the frank version, this is the real unvarnished version. The city manager and I felt the urban renewal authority had too much money. And because it had a sales tax increment based at a 1989 base. You remember that slide, the property tax base goes up, but the sales tax increment doesn't go up in our case, because we didn't negotiate it that way. So by the end of our urban renewal project, um, the urban renewal was getting about $800,000 a year in sales tax increment. So the city manager and I didn't think that was right. And this was, was when I wasn't in both positions, economic development guy and DDA guy. So we, our plan allows a small portion of sales tax until 2024 to get the DDA started which for this year will be $130,000. And it, it grew quite a bit because we've had strong sales tax growth. Our five mil property tax generates $270,000 this year. Um, our increment only generated, um, it generated $9,000 last year and $90,000 this year because we had some big projects that were started right as the DDA was being developed and it will go up to about 120,000 next year. And then the, the GURA and the, the city's contributions were 100,000 each, but only through 2019. So if you add that all together, it's about 800,000, I think. Um, if you go 270, 130, say another 100 for the increment, and 200 from the city and GURA. So, um, is, does TIF apply to the parking tax to the property value increase or just sales tax? No, um, both. And so what's weird is if, you, if your property existed in its current form when we established, then DDA only gets its five mil property tax off your property. If, you, if your property was built since our DDA was established, then the DDA gets that five mills plus everybody else's mills on that property for a period of years. And in the third case of sales tax, um, the DDA is getting all, one, ha one third of the increased sales tax over 2014 levels for the whole district. But what's, what's weird, and our assessor had never dealt with the DDA before in Jeffco, um, we are both a taxing entity because we have our five mills, and we are an increment entity. But the, and the five mills on new construction comes in under increment, and the five mills under existing value comes in under, under a taxing entity. Um, whoever, if you end up with something like this, whoever runs it will get really good at dealing with the county assessor and their record keeping methods. So our revenue changes a lot after 2019 because we don't have the seed money from the city and urban renewal anymore. And after 2024, when we don't have sales tax, the, the, the um, assumption is that by then we have enough. And you know, our programs run, um, and you know, if you get right down and dirty, um, Trash removal is one of our bigger problems, um, and the city, because it traditionally has handles emptying the trash cans um, several days a week, but our, our main trash hauler wouldn't do Sundays. And when we have events downtown, Sunday trash removal became a big issue that we had to go up, fix, we had to come up with somebody to, to pay for that. And my big bugaboo, much as I, much as I love the holidays, um, it costs us $80,000 a year for holiday lights, and um, the businesses really like them. And they, you know, if you're a retailer, you're making a huge chunk of your money in November and December, and for us to have those holiday lights up from November through, now they want them up through Valentine's Day for the end of the stock show and then Valentine's Day, that's real important to them, but um, life is expensive running a downtown. Um, we haven't even dealt with our wayfinding signs. Our way, some of our wayfinding signs de, um, date to 1992 to a streetscape project we did right at the beginning of this whole story.
some of the art that you guys have put there, specifically at the river. Is that part of the DBA itself, or do you have some kind of a arts uh, and culture district or something? We have a public art commission that was established after the fact. Um, no, it's, it's great to be recorded, you know? So I, I just have to trust your discretion. Um, we have a structure now because the city council about eight years ago was not happy with the, the non-transparent way that bronzes just kept showing up. So much of the collection was donated by some local philanthropic folks and there was this, um, the lesson we learned from Loveland, which has a little bit wilder art, is the city council didn't want to be the um, art selectors because every, at least, not at least, exactly half of the community hates everything you do. And if it's a little bit wilder, maybe more than half. So um, this local <coughs> civic group and a few people on staff who were installing them were just doing them. Um, our mayor at the time didn't like that at all, so we now have a public art commission, but almost all of the collection has been donated. Um, city council does, when they can, provide annual funds to the art commission, and, for ex and we're, we're trying to move away from traditional Western bronzes. Um, we have a kind of a weird hummingbird at the corner of Golden Road and Ulysses that's it's steel and it's, the, the feathers are made out of car hoods. It's really quite attractive. Um, so diversifying it is the th deal, but it, it's a great attraction to downtown, but it's also a, a matter of controversy because there are folks that are tired of Western historic bronzes. No, we have a, um, one of my projects right now is um, council and staff got kind of tired of having this conversation every few years. Uh, we had a failed lodging tax election about 15 years ago um, because council put it on the election and said, well, that's a good idea, let's have a lodging tax. And um, nobody supported it and the lodging industry opposed it and it didn't pass. The, the idea that Lodging tax is always passed because it's, uh, somebody else will pay it, the residents won't pay it, doesn't always prove true in Colorado because we're cautious about taxes. So we're in the mix of doing that and there's a recommendation to, um, there's two front runners right now. One is cultural and the arts and the other is open space parks and trails. And um, before this midterm election, um, our, our council elections are in the odd years, which has the lowest turnout. Um, it's, it's funny to look at turnout that, in, I just saw last night, um, Colorado had the second highest turnout for the election last week, um, but a 20, 2020 is the year that the proponents are going for, that there'll be the maximum number of people. No, because most of the lodging is not downtown. Yeah. But the arts and culture people, they want to be downtown. Yes, sir. Okay, our board is seven members. We, like, we tend to like seven, but state statute allows up to 11. And any decision of importance they make. Um, for example, um, oh, the other, <laughs> the other thing about holiday lights is the electricity keeps breaking. If you have an electrical system in a downtown area over the years, so, um, Recently, I, I authorized, without going to the board, um, repainting some railings on our big Washington Avenue bridge over Clear Creek with big towers on it for about $5,000. Um, I routinely will authorize things like um, electrical fix com repairs because they need to happen for the holiday lights. But they, they approve any contract, um, certainly any, any tax increment deal the board would approve. 
Um, and they approve the budget every year that gives us our line items. Oh, and they approve any grant. Um, my assistant who was here at the last meeting and I, she approves website grants up to $1,000 and energy efficiency matching grants up to 2500 But every other grant goes to the board, every budget approval goes to the board, and any big contract goes to the board. Meet once a month. And I think we have, um, right now we have one resident, oh, we have one, oh, you can have a city councilor on, no, I think you have to have a city councilor on there. So we have one city councilor, one resident, two retailers, and three property owners, or, or property or business owners. How do you deal with uh, property owners that don't want to be in the We try to convince them that, um, that the majority made a good choice. And they would, they, they would be included? They're in it. Okay. it you know, if, and, well, we let Miller Coors not be in it because they really didn't want to. So we didn't want to have a major fight. And also, we didn't see much change on their property. It would, have, it would have been great to get some property tax from them, but we didn't see that they really needed us, and we didn't want to have a big fight. Maybe you discussed this earlier, but how do you decide uh, from a DDA as opposed to a bid? Oh, I, I, we were more comfortable with the revenue structure, the ability to, to use tax increment and the property tax. But it was, it was much more similar to what we already had. You know, perhaps it would have been more innovative to try the BID, but um, it felt more comfortable to try the DDA. So how did you sell it to the resident, residential portion of the DDA? The, much of the residential, um, of the folks that are more active, are higher-end condos that were built from 2005 to 2012 right in the downtown core who really chose to be there. But we had to sell it based on um, amenities like the, um, well, maintenance of the streetscape. And it, it was hard. It was hard. That fortunately, enough of them felt that the, rena the renaissance of downtown was good for downtown and, and they really enjoyed living there and they were willing to pay a little bit. But also, um, there, there is a phenomenon that I, I hear of everywhere. Um, young people buy apartments, or move into apartments or condos downtown because it's so vital and wonderful and then they have a kid and then they complain about the noise all the time mm -hmm. and they want to move out. Um, but that, that was the hardest sell, was the resident, residents, and um, I don't know what the vote turnout was. The vote turnout was strong, but the breakdown between residents, property owners, and businesses, because clearly the property owners, frankly, um, if, if your business will pay the tax for you, if you do a triple net lease, the property owners benefit the most. Property values are maintained, there's, there's assistance for redevelopment when it's warranted, facade grants, and then, then businesses second, and the residents, they really need to be committed to downtown. Are we too long? Did, did Golden do anything with parking? Yes. Um, the Urban Renewal Authority ended up doing two projects. One was a partnership with an office and residential complex, so we and the, the city ended up inheriting those assets because we thought it would make more sense. Um, for the, and we also have a downtown general improvement district from the 60s that doesn't do anything other than now it collects two mills and it helps maintain parking. But the last big project that Urban Renewal did included a 250 space parking structure and um, it was all free at the time. Um, so we have 40% ownership in a 300 space structure and we own, the city now has that condo ownership and owns the other structure and then we own some surface lots that the city has owned for years. We had to impose permit and paid parking downtown because the School of Mines parking was spilling into the downtown area to, at a rate that we couldn't take anymore. Um, so we imposed, um, and it was, it, it's shocking how it wasn't more terrible than it could have, than it was. Um, um, the first two hours are free, 
So all, all of the streets downtown are two hour free parking. The main streets, Washington Avenue, is just two hour. You're, you're supposed to only be there short term. Some of the side streets allow employees to park on them with a permit. And our parking structures and parking lots are paid or permit, but if you go to pay, it gives you the first two hours free. And it's not been so bad. I'm, I'm always amazed. And the, the capacity went up dramatically when we pushed the mines people out of downtown. Yes. Oh, um, we also have very low admin costs because um, the city made a deal. Um, I, have, I have one person, and she splits her time 50% between the DDA, 35% with our urban renewal, and 15% with an economic development stuff I have her do. Um, the only administrative costs that the DDA pays are 50% of her overall salary and benefits, $10,000 for me per year, and um, our share of the audit and our legal costs, and consultant if we have to do a deal. So one of the biggest benefits of um, the, the, from the city's, one problem we had at the end was the urban renewal had a quarter of a million dollar administrative budget for lots of people and to rent their own office space because they were totally independent. So this is where I never know where I'm saying things that they want me to say or don't want me to say. But <laughs> we do so much better by having Robin and I, me as a high-ranking city staff person, run these the URA and the DDA and economic development for the city because we are all aligned these days. Um, one time, seriously, between 89 and 2014, council was going to abolish the URA because they were mad at the board. And we had minor disagreements about policy, such as me and the manager thinking they had too much money and not liking how they spent it. Um, pretty much that all went away when we have council on both URA and DDA um, representation and um, me being staff for all three. But you could imagine, if, if, you had, if you had to go out and rent space, and you had a director, and you have to have someone there to answer the phone, and you had all that overhead, um, it's, it would be absurd to have administrative costs be 25% of your budget, whereas now they are 8% of the budget. Yeah, I see that for us. <clears throat> if something was moved forward here, that's certainly something I'd be very open about, is how we might uh, negotiate some kind of an administrative piece to that for the city instead. I mean, you have to be lean to, for, for the, the, the business property owners and residents deserve the leanest administration possible. No, because it's too soon. Um, I do have a way to quantify the way the URA did. Be, well, if, if you believe it, um, by looking at the, the assessed value downtown the increases in assessed value downtown compared to the increases in assessed value in other parts of the community. Now you could argue that it's just downtown is naturally going to not only have higher property values but also increase in assessed value. Um, but when the, the, the stakeholders love it, the, the, bus the businesses, um, you know, the businesses would go ballistic if we didn't have holiday lights and the level of maintenance that we have. Have you seen a substantial increase in sales tax for that area from prior to forming the DDA and now after the DDA? Is there, did you see an increase in business? For <coughs> no. I, honestly, that happened in the early 2000s. We had huge uptake about 10 years into, 10, 15 years into the URA project. Right now, we are strong and stable and slowly growing. But we continue to, the quality of merchant has gone up. The quality of restaurant has gone up. 
Um, one of the tough things downtown is um, rents are going up and the people that can afford the higher rents are restaurants, entertainment, and expensive sporting goods stores. Um, we have like lots, of, we have like four bike stores downtown and one climbing goods stores. It's hard for a mom and, one of the aspects of success, it's hard for a mom and pop gift store to deal with uh, rent increases over the years. So unless you have a strong relationship with your landlord and you've been there a long time, um, some of the general retail is, is you know, moving to the side streets. I don't know. It, I mean, retailers really want to be there, and they they don't. They just have to be. I don't. I don't know. They have to be really smart because um, it's it's hard to sell that many gifts. Um, but there's zero vacancy. Downtown storefronts don't go on the market. Um, they are rented before anyone knows that the last person is moving out and they're, they're usually moving out for personal family reasons rather than they, they weren't making money. We had a bookstore that couldn't make it because um, just that whole industry can't make it. Um, but generally, um, we're I guess I'm surprised but how, li how little failure there is and how many people there are who are willing to open retail businesses. And God love them. If any of you guys are running retail businesses, God love you. So maybe we should move on, and then because this was this was this was much more fun than last time. Last time it was a presentation. Thank you. It's like it's not. We need to do it here. There it is. Okay, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Kevin Tilson. He's with Castle Rock. Kevin has worked in economic development for over 12 years, working at the municipal, county, and state level. At Adams County Economic Development, Kevin focused on the retention and attraction of primary employers, working close with municipal partners. He also managed the enterprise zone at the local level, helping businesses in distressed areas create new jobs and expand their operations. At the state level, Kevin under Governor Ritter and Hickenlooper in the Office of Economic Development and International Trade worked to attract and retain some of the largest employers in the state. At the state, he managed the Enterprise Zone and focused on assisting distressed areas, including many historic main streets throughout the state. He also managed the Venture Capital Authority and Colorado Innovation Investment Tax Credit Programs, which focused on strengthening the growth, uh, growing investment in venture capital industry in the state. Kevin currently works for Castle Rock Downtown Alliance, serving as the director of the Castle Rock Downtown Development Authority and Downtown Merchants Association. The Castle Rock Downtown Alliance works to create an active and vibrant downtown through a two-pronged approach with the DDA focusing on infrastructure and the built environment with the DMA focusing on producing events, activities, and activities that foster vibrancy. Thank you, Kevin. And here's Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. As she said, my name is Kevin Tilson. I'm the director of the Castle Rock Downtown Alliance. And I think Steve asked, were, were you guys here for the first presentation? Okay, then I, I can kind of go through it quickly, but maybe it's more helpful to just jump into questions shortly after I, I kind of run through our structure. I, I think perhaps kind of where you guys are at or my understanding of of what Littleton is trying to do is, is really on how does downtown organize itself? So I can kind of tell you what we've done in Castle Rock to organize our downtown, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. We're somewhat unique, or, or I think we are unique, in that we have two downtown organizations. We've got the Downtown Merchants Association and the Downtown Development Authority. And they, they were formed independently. 
with, with similar but different goals. And um, now we've kind of restructured and, and together the Merchants Association and the Development Authority are one organization, they're the Downtown Alliance. Um, m many years ago we had a, a number of our downtown businesses get together who were all members of our Castle Rock Chamber and say we really need a voice of downtown. Um, they recognized that downtown was somewhat unique. It had unique challenges, it had um, unique retailers and it just felt a little bit different than the rest of the community and so they wanted an organization that represented the voice of downtown and so they formed a 501c6 that became the downtown merchants association and I'd say they have really two goals one is they're the voice of downtown and two is they put on a lot of events in downtown as a way to get people into town um, over the years the merchants association has kind of toyed with this idea of well, well, where do we market ourselves? How do we either become a tourist destination or how do we put out ads that bring people in? And we've tried a lot of different things. Um, I think the result is if you want people in downtown, we've been much more successful producing an event and having the people come to the event um, and then see downtown, maybe spend a dollar while they're there or, or see something really cool and get their family and friends and come back later rather than get the ad to convince them to take action and come to downtown. So that's kind of the direction the Merchants Association has gone. Um, independently and a number of years later, our, our town formed a downtown advisory commission. They knew they wanted to do something more and they need, knew that they needed a funding stream to do it. And so they formed a DDA. The downtown advisory commission was loosely organized. It had town staff on it. It had residents, it had business owners, property owners, and our town council all on a big committee that would convene and talk about what they wanted to do in downtown. And out of that uh, downtown advisory commission, they all agreed that they wanted to go the route of creating a DDA. And so then they put out, as Steve mentioned, a ballot initiative to the, you know, again, the business owners, the property owners, and the residents in the district who voted to create the DDA to tax themselves three mills. They could have gone up to five. We only did three in Castle Rock. And then the, the third was that we would be a tax increment financing district. And they specifically looked at that because the tax increment financing district allowed the DDA and the town council to have a funding tool that if they wanted to go do something, whether it was attract a mixed-use project that otherwise wouldn't come to Castle Rock and the project wouldn't pencil, that they would have a tool to help them do that. Or if they wanted to do streetscape or, you know, uh, Tivoli lights over Main Street, or if they wanted to do enhancements in our park, they would have a funding source that meant that the, the business owners and the town council could look at this sort of dedicated funding source for downtown rather than look at the general fund, which had a lot of um, demands on it for many of the other resources that are needed in a, in a town. So that was the reason they went to the DDA. Both have independent boards. We're, we're kind of like Golden, we like the number seven. So we have seven business owners that represent the board for the Merchants Association and we have seven business owners that represent the board for the Downtown Development Authority. And now we have one set of staff. So, so myself, I, I've got um, two people and then I share an office manager with our Castle Rock Economic Development Council. So again, Steve, Steve pointed out a lot of the challenges, but I think if you're going to be independent from the, from the town or the municipality, you have to be lean. And so for that reason, we have one set of staff serving two boards, the Merchants Association and the Development Authority, and then my two boards have a staffing contract with the Castle Rock EDC. And, and so all together, we've got seven employees We've got three organizations and we all sort of worked for, for a common good, for a common vision of an active and vibrant downtown for my two organizations and an active and vibrant community if you include the, the EDC. So that's our structure. Um, you know, I've, I've got a lot of slides here. You know, our boundaries, some of the events we do. Um, maybe if I was to make one other point here, um, and I think Steve touched on it, um, here as well in that there was an efficiency to him being the staff for the DDA, for the URA, um, 
and, and also having a, a perspective that, that um, recognizes the challenges of, of the municipality. If you're not all one person doing it, it is absolutely vital that if you have separate organizations that you, you meet regularly, it's a million cups of coffee, you have to meet with your town council members, with your business owners, with your town staff, all of your department heads, to all stay on the page, uh, all stay on the same page. Um, without that, there's too many competing interests for, for dollars and for needs. Um, so it's, you, you have to have a lot of dedicated people that really want to work together and they really want to communicate um, effectively. Um, is, is there any questions? Is there anything that you'd like me to touch on? I mean, I can kind of go yeah. through a lot. We do. Um, state statute requires that when you create a DDA, that you create a plan of development. So when the DDA was created, it was our downtown advisory commission that helped draft that plan of development. The DDA board then blessed it or approved it. The town council then approved it. And then very similarly, I've got a slide on it here. Um, very similarly, then, then the town created their master plan. So they've got a master plan that is really you know, similar maps, similar goals. Uh, it's almost the same document. One is written from the perspective of what it means for public works and development services in all of the town departments. And, and then we have kind of our plan of development that is really our marching orders from the town council and our board for what we're supposed to accomplish in, in downtown. That's a really good question. Um, we do a lot of cups of coffee. I anytime we're working on a project, I get a cup of coffee with every town council member. Sometimes I meet with the town manager, and then we go meet with two of the council members. Um, sometimes I get a DDA board member and a town council member. We do, by state statute, and Steve touched on this, for our seven DDA board members, one of them is a town council member. So. Uh, you know, the, the thought there is that the town council member who is on the board, she sits through all of the meetings, and, and then she goes back to her, you know, fellow people up at the, at the dais, and, and she could kind of be the voice of, hey, I sat through three hours of meetings, here was the outcome, and it was well thought out, it was well planned, and, you know, she can kind of be that advocate for, um, for, for success, success there. Yes, 
Um, Who regulates yeah. events? City or the merchant association? And now the city does. Um, so they've hired a specific person that is sort of the event manager citywide. Um, and, and so they kind of help to organize everyone that, you know, the chamber who does a lot of events in Castle Rock doesn't plan an event on the same day that, that we plan an event. Um, we kind of reached out in, in that spirit and said, hey, what, what if we met with the town, the county, the chamber, and then the Merchants Association once a month we don't need to meet, we won't have a meeting, but if anybody's planning an event, that is kind of our opportunity to coordinate events, pick our dates, um, look at the theme of the event, what we're trying to accomplish, and we can all kind of work together. Um, and it was a little slow going at the start, but now it's really efficient. We, we've kind of streamlined our processes for food trucks. We all have very similar fees, we have very similar um, layouts that we know work well with police and fire and street closures and business owners. Um, and so that kind of monthly meeting of everybody getting together to be on the same page has been really important. And, um, you know, it's somewhat led by the, the, the municipal partner who sort of convenes that meeting. So those events, um, how do you market them? We go entirely social media and our website. We used to spend a boatload of money running ads in our local paper, um, in local magazines. And um, we gambled, I think, three years ago and decided to do zero print ads. And we boost Facebook posts. We, we put money behind our Facebook posts. And we realize we are missing a demographic of people that are not on Facebook. Um, we have found that there are a lot of Castle Rock moms and dads that are on Facebook looking for free events. And so we will put out an ad and maybe put $100 behind it to boost it. And we get a tremendous reach. Um, after doing print ads for years and years, um, we now pull back on our marketing because we don't want too many people there. You know, we do an out, outdoor movie in the park, and um, the park can only hold so many people. We've got a big inflatable movie screen. And since we've gone to social media, we pack the park. In fact, we will wait to um, market that event online until we get closer to the event because we don't want the buildup and the sharing of our posts to get too large that so many people show up to the park that they can't find a spot to see, sit. And then that experience you know, becomes a negative one for a lot of people. Um, so it's been very effective. Um, you know, certainly there's a demographic, demographic of people that we miss, though, that aren't maybe on on social media. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. To show your appreciate our appreciation for your being here, we've Lamar has kindly donated all of these donuts, so every one of you can take a box of those <laughs> with you. Um, Eric, I've got to do I've, I've got one last thing I'm gonna hold you hostage for. I just want to get mine back. Okay, that's good. Okay, so I just wanted to show you some of the things that are possible with a district. Um, and I'm asking you just to kind of imagine some of the things we might be able to do downtown if we had this kind of a, a formation. So here's some examples of some pretty interesting sidewalk and street improvements. Um, and you know the grates that are around our trees down there, they're just grates and you can do plantings and, and banners on the light posts and uh, very interesting uh, above ground planters. Uh, this one's one of my favorites because I, you all have probably seen alley activation in different areas. Um, this one up in the left corner that one was provided by Mark. He was just in Washington, D.C., and that one is a very interesting adaptation of the alley. Uh, the two down below are Dairy Block downtown. Uh, it's a really interesting way to close off the street and draw people in through uh, the back. Grand Junction has done this successfully in a lot of ways. Street furnishings. Uh, you know, we have a lot of stuff downtown that's okay, but it's not necessarily aesthetically pleasing, but that could be improved. 
gathering places. You know, we have some places where that opportunity might exist, uh, and we could make these improvements to draw people downtown, and maybe they stay longer and spend a little more money. These are my favorites. <laughs> Parking, obviously, is something that we're all going to have to address in the future, but it doesn't have to look like a parking structure. And these don't necessarily fit for Littleton, but um, screening the parking is a good possibility as well. So, so that's basically it. And uh, we'll be in touch with everybody, and maybe during next steps we could arrange to have a charrette or something where we're all coming together to kind of discuss different ideas. But if you have any questions or concerns, then please get in touch with our department. And uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>